Thank you, Mark. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have the easy task here. I'm going to just introduce you to some concepts and then the distinguished speakers that, that will follow me are going to go into details. Uh, I thank you for joining this session and thank Mark for organizing it. Uh, you will listen to a number of uh, distinguished um, researchers working in the field of structural instrumentation and uh, structural health monitoring. I hope by the end of this session you realize the real importance of, of this subject and this uh, technical tool that is available now and you will motivate it to uh, consider this technology in your research and practice. What can this technology do for you? Well, let me start with an example. Assume that you can accurately identify the dynamic characteristics of a building. Probably most often you can't, but let's assume that you can. I also assume that you know or we know the input ground motion that that building experienced or it is going to experience, which we might not know. Now assume that we know the level of forces that that building was, was designed for, the capacities provided and all that good stuff. Even if you know all these things, it would be very difficult to assess the damage based on the design information that we use in designing building structures. Let me give you an example. Let's take a look at the uh, Imperial Valley County Services Building, which was damaged, as you see, during the 1979 Imperial Valley earthquake. All a line of columns all busted at the base level. Now let's take a look. This, this building was instrumented, not, not a whole lot of instruments, but it was enough instrumentation in there to capture the accelerations and from the accelerations deduce the interstory drifts. Approximate, but good enough. Now, if you look at the stuff that you look at as a designer, one thing that you look at is what was the earthquake ground motion at the site? What was the design level that the, this building was designed for or the design spectrum implied in the code that this building was designed for. If you look at the east-west direction of this building and look at the north-south direction of the building, you see the response spectrum of the input ground motion shown in red and the design, oopsie, the design spectrum shown in blue. As you see, there is not a whole lot of difference in the east-west and north-south direction. In, in the east-west as well as in the north-south, the input exceeds the design uh, curve in the short periods, and, and the, the design curve is over the input motion in the longer periods. So I, I can't see a whole lot of difference between the east, west, and north, south here. Now if you go one step further and do a structural identification and capture the, the the, the frequencies of the first five modes of this building in, in east-west direction and north-south direction. And we are looking at, at that here. You will see that, that spectral acceleration, and these are mode 1 to 5 in the east-west direction, mode 1 to 5 in the north-south direction. You see that for mode 1, the design spectrum is higher than the input. On the second mode in the east-west, it's the same thing. Only in the third mode in the east-west, you see that the input spectrum exceeds the design spectrum. Now you go to the north-south direction, same thing for the uh, first mode, the, the, uh, the input is less than the, the design. The second mode, the input exceeds uh, the design by a large margin. Same thing for the third mode, and then we come back to the uh, same picture. So if we were judging the performance of this building by looking at this information, which is the information that we routinely use in design, and routinely check the, you know, the adequacy of the building bed, you would say that this building probably did far worse in north-south direction, if anything happened to it, than in the east-west direction. But, well, but if you take a look at the recorded motion, the recorded acceleration, and then deduce the, the drifts, the story drifts from it, you see a completely different picture. You see that in the east-west direction, the floor moved about more than three inches, about 10 centimeters, while in the north-south direction, it moved about one-fourth or one-fifth of that. So obviously, from recorded ground motion that you can get by in, through instrumentation, you can clearly see that if something happened to this building, it would have happened in the first floor in the east-west direction. 
And that's exactly what happened. And all those columns that went were in the east-west direction. And that is the information you cannot get from uh, design calculations. Now, you can get the same information if you have just applied the Newton's law to the first floor of this building, apply it to the accelerations, and draw a hysteretic diagram based on the recorded motion, and you will see that in the east-west direction there was a whole lot of activity happening than in the north-south direction. Now, some people say, I'm, that's fine, but I'm not ready to say this building is damaged or not if I haven't seen it. This, I applied this to a building that I knew beforehand, and, I, and I'm not ready to do that to say if the building is damaged or not based just on the recorded stuff that I get, and you are extrapolating. And that is fine. You don't have to do that. That's why the, the fragilities are there for, and there are, there are many, many, in, in, in terms of hundreds of fragilities now being developed for the new uh, generation of performance-based design by ATC58 and others that you can use. How can you use the fragilities with a structural instrumentation in order to assess damage? Let's take an, a very uh, simple example, a non-structural item, uh, a panel, a wall panel, and then you, are, you increase the interstory drift you get to a stage that you get a slight cracking like this one, call that damage state one. You increase the drift in testing or, or whatever. You get to, a, to more cracking, damage state two. You have damage to the panels and keep pushing this. You get a damage state three, which might look like this. Now, based on many tests, I mean, this is results of, of tests over 13 years of experimental research, then you can, you can, these are being collected and you are provided with fragility curves that gives you the probability of being in any of these stages of damage or exceeding of them depending on the amount of drift you have. Now, if, if these are plotted and these are going to be available, some of them are available, some of them are going to be available shortly, these can be plotted. The probability of being in any state, undamaged or, or small damage or larger damage, can be extracted if you know how much drift the building is or, or that a story is experiencing. Then, you know, what green is no damage. Yellow is, you know, moderate damage. And then you have orange and, and uh, red for, for excessive damage. And then from here, you can come in and say, okay, if I have, let's say, a drift of this much, then these are the probabilities of being in any different damage state in different colors. So I can pull that out, and I say, if this floor saw that much drift, these are the probabilities of being in different damage states. I can, in another floor, you got another. Let's say this was 6% drift. The other one might be something else. Not 2% drift, you, you are, the probability of damage is like that. I mean, the undamaged probability is a whole lot more than severe. Actually, you don't have a red zone here. Now you can rotate it around, and for each floor of your building, you can show the probabilities of damage based on if it's, it is drift sensitive, based on drift, if it is acceleration, based on acceleration, and if it is uh, velocity, based on velocity. And we have done that. And, and let's say, take a look at the, this 50-story, 52-story building. We applied some fragilities to it, and, and based on the recorded motion, uh, this is a CSMIP instrumented building uh, obtained from various earthquakes, and you can take a look. You know, 1991 Sierra Madre earthquake. This type of analysis that we did, as I showed you, shows that this building should not have been damaged, and it was not. This is green from floor one to floor 52 in both directions. Now you go to another one, 1992 landers, you see, oh, there's got to be some non-structural damage here. There are probabilities of some non-structural damage. It doesn't look that there is any severe damage to this, and that was the case too. Now if you go to, to 1994 Northridge earthquake, you see that there are some zones that you could have more severe damage. This is just an example. It's, it's not the finished product. But these are the type of information that you can get from uh, instrumentation of the building and the structural health monitoring that you cannot get otherwise. So in conclusion, uh, this technology, structural health monitoring and instrumentation, is not the technology of the future. It is here now. 
And it is absolutely amazing to me that given the nominal, relatively nominal cost of implementing instrumentation in building and the huge advantage that we can get out of that, it is not widely used. I hope by listening to the experts gathered here today, you realize the value and efficiency of a structural health monitoring and instrumentation, and you will use it in your research and practice. Thank you very much. Mark? In the haste of welcome.